Okay. <clears throat> well, good evening. Welcome to another lecture. This is our ninth going through historical theology, specifically the doctrine of God and the Trinity. And again, looking at the objectives of the course, if you've forgotten, which I hope you haven't, we're going to be examining the development of the doctrine of God, uh, especially, especially the Trinity. Um, we're really looking at the essence and the attributes of God as we see developed uh, from really the beginning of the church up until the modern era. So we get to look at some key figures of the Christian tradition that were pivotal pillars of of Christian theology as far as the the um, the orthodoxy that we confess today as Christians. Uh, it was that was developed. You know, obviously, the Scripture is is the backbone, is the foundation, is the true the true instructor. Um, but as the church faces the heretical theology of the world, heretical teachings of the world, um, through the scriptures, we refine our thought uh, to remain uh, glued to the text. But ultimately, we do end up developing doctrine that um, uh, isn't even you know, the nomenclature or the actual word itself is found in the text, but we utilize other truth, in a sense, um, outside of scripture to help us articulate what scripture does teach. So um, we're very thankful um, when we talk about the doctrine of God. Uh, it is a robust, mighty doctrine. Uh, it is inexhaustible. Um, it is speculative. A lot of people don't like speculative theology, but um, there is a grammar to how we talk about God, and that's what we've been kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, seeing progress as we've been going through um, our, our courses here. So. Tonight, I probably should put that maybe on this side. Okay. There we go. So tonight we are going to be looking at um, a key thinker. Oop, I always mess the slides up. There we go. Gregory of Nyssa. <clears throat> so Gregory of Nyssa is one of the three of the Cappadocian, the trio, the Cappadocians. Um, they are part of the Eastern Church, and these three guys, and God likes threes, but these three guys, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, uh, Gregory of Nazianzus, and St. Basil the Great, um, were truly, truly momentous figures in the development of the Doctrine of the Trinity. So we're going to start with Gregory tonight, uh, looking at uh, various treatises that he had written, and we're going to be really going through this grammar that we start to see um, emerge in the Pro Nicene theology. Um, and so, as we look at what Gregory is talking about as far as his development in this area, his is through a uh, polemical address. So, poly uh, polemics means like war in Greek. And so, basically, he's having these treatises or these doctrinal disputes with those that are really kind of perverting, perverting the doctrine of God, if you will. And, um, and Gregory of Nyssa is a very rigorous thinker. And definitely, um, I think you'll really appreciate what he has to say. Uh, you probably want to listen to this one a couple times. I know even just reading his works, his writings, when I was uh, years back in, in doctoral work, um, I had to read a particular one of his treatises we'll look at here a little bit later um, called On Not Three Gods and about five pages, but man, it took me many hours to really, really grasp what he was saying. So with that, let's get started. <clears throat> So Gregory was uh, lived around from 330 to 395. He was the Bishop of Nyssa in 371, which is why he's called Gregory of Nyssa. Um, again, he's the Cappadocian trio. He was instrumental in the development of, the Trinita of Trinitarian Orthodoxy. His theological prowess was pivotal in response to the Arian and Sabellian heresies. And those of you that are familiar with church history or historical theology will know of Arianism. Uh, we just talked about that in the previous lecture. And Sabellianism... Uh, was ultimately what led to what we call modalism, that God, uh, though he's he takes the form of one of the of the Trinitarian persons, not whereas the Trinitarian theology is that God is three um, distinct um, um, relations within the one being of God, um, whereas Sibelianism, that God takes the, the form of one in a certain moment. So not three exist simultaneously, only one uh, exist in that time. So he went from he takes the shape of the Son, then he'll take the shape of the Spirit, then he'll take the shape of the Father, and that's a, a heresy. 
So, in Gregory's writings, we find an emergence of a pro-Nicene grammar of divinity through his developed account of divine power. And this is really helpful when it comes to <clears throat> articulating the oneness and the threeness of God and how they share in the divinity and the power that they ex exude. And that sharing the divine power is a is a key or, or a linking um, aspect, if you will, of, of defining how the three persons are truly of the one God. So, as I said, we'll be, we'll be surveying the handful of his treatises and letters, observing the rigors of his theology and precision in his argumentation. Um, a monarchical view of the Trinity will be traced out as this is the key to a logically sound trinity from which many in contemporary theism have drifted. Uh, Trinitarian theology has been a um, kind of all the rage in the last probably 30 years, 20, 30 years, maybe a little more, but um, really the view that modern theology kind of moved to was away from Orthodox Trinitarianism. So which is that's the reason why I'm also doing these courses, or these lectures, excuse me, to kind of really get us back to the classical tradition. So... Um, his longest dogmatic treatise is called Against Eunomius, and it is an erudite piece of work. I will say that again. It is truly an erudite piece of work. In this treatise, Gregory leaves no stone unturned as he dismantles Eunomius' claims and objections, responding to his abuse of our Father and God. Now, it's not my intention to trace out the barrage of counterattacks on Eunomius, um, so I want to observe, uh, bloop, bloop, bloop. excuse me, <laughs> as I said, I always do that in every single lecture. All right. So one observation in this treatise is that Gregory goes to great lengths responding to Eunomius's misunderstanding of ungenerate and generate, i.e. the father who was ungenerate and the son who was generate. And this was another aspect of the embroiled battle of the Arian controversy. Now, we will not spend much time in this treatise other than to exposit Gregory's views on the essence and attributes of God. Um, some exposition will include elements of it as they pertain to the subject matter, but also to get a general sense of the argument. Well, the key point of debate was whether the Son has the same nature as God the Father because he is from the Father. So the Arians tried many tactics to show that the Son, though mighty and powerful, was nevertheless not of the same essence as the Father. Gregory writes two responses to Eunomius, refuting his claim that because the Son is generate from the Father who is ungenerate, then he is not eternal like the Father. Therefore, there was a time when the sun was not. And I mentioned that in our last lecture. That was the airing controversy. There was a time when the sun was not. Gregory goes to the mat with Eunomius because his problem is he's confusing terms and categories. And that's why I mentioned about how the kind of precision that Gregory lays out for us, and he just bit by bit, um, rigorously, theologically, methodologically, dismantles Eunomius. So, so ungenerate and generate pertain to the relations between the Father and the Son. Eunomius argues that the Son being generated from the Father, who is ungenerate, means that there was a time when the Son did not exist. Thus, he was generated from the Father. So he's, he's kind of, he's thinking more along the lines of human generation, right? Obviously, there was a time when I didn't exist, but then my parents generated me, okay? Um, so, you know, Miss here, he's confusing relations with essence. And that's important. Relations with essence. He's confusing those two. Uh, and, but Gregory sees through his sophistry and refutes him. So there's definitely a lot of snarky that's going on in these debates, just so you guys know. It's kind of funny. But <clears throat> anyways, so here are some of Gregory's remarks explaining the divine economy. He writes, For there with the Father, unoriginate, ungenerate, always father. The idea of the son as coming from him, yet side by side with him, is inseparably joined. And through the son, and yet with him, before any vague and unsubstantial conception comes in between, the Holy Spirit is found at once in closest union, not, subse not subsequent 
in existence to the Son, as if the Son could be thought of as ever having been without the Spirit. Pause there. A lot of words. <laughs> Very clunky. But he's, again, he's trying to be uh, thorough in what he's saying. And he says, but himself also owning the same cause of his being, i.e. the God overall as the only begotten light, and having shown forth in that very light, being indivisible, neither by duration nor by an alien nature from the Father or from the only begotten. There are no intervals in that pre-temporal world, and difference on the score of being there is none. It is not even possible, comparing the uncreate with the uncreated, to see differences, and the Holy Ghost is uncreate, as we have shown before. It <laughs> sounds a little confusing, but we'll talk through this. So when it comes to the essence of God, Gregory holds to the true faith position, which says, The essence of God is incapable of being grasped by any term or any idea or any other device of our apprehension. End quote. And while this designation is accepted by all as proper of the Father, orthodoxy holds that the only name given which fully represents that which is beyond reach of human utterance is the name above all names, Philippians 2.9, of the only begotten Jesus Christ our Lord. The words of John the Apostle tell us that all that the Father has is the Son's. It's John 3.35 and 16.15. Therefore, the Son is God of God. We find the substance of Gregory's doctrine of God in his answer to Eunomius' second book. It is much shorter than the first, and then we get into his shorter treatises devoted specifically to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Trinity. Uh, excuse me. He also provides some remarks on the errors of taking the anthropomorphic language too far. Do you remember what anthropomorphic language is? If you don't, go back a few lectures and I will tell you. Hold on a second. Sorry, I'm not so polished here. I got a bit of a runny nose today. But I'm too lazy to pause the camera. Okay. A letter to his brother Peter, where Gregory analyzes the terms usia and hypostasis, providing the clearest understanding and use of these terms in the Cappadocian's theology. Um, I have a footnote. Nah, I'm not worried about that. Okay. Lastly, and most uh, contributory to the classical doctrine of the Trinity is his to oblivious on not three gods. And we'll be looking at that in more detail later on. In his second book, Gregory continues his response to Eunomius regarding the generate-ungenerate debate. He begins with the foundational claim, which, Eunomo, which Eunomius agrees that the Godhead, Godhead is by nature simple. It is indivisible and without composition. As to disagreement, Gregory writes, Our orthodox confession teaches us to believe in the only begotten God, so that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. These men reject the orthodox terms whereby the greatness of the Son is signified as on, on a par with the dignity of the Father. End quote. So, divine simplicity is a point of contention because, as Gregory argues, the Son is of the same essence as the Father, Thus, so he too is simple and incomposite. Simplicity is the divine essence. Elsewhere, Gregory notes, God has a logos. And he would be without reason if he did not. We talked about this in the past, about Christ being the wisdom and the power of God. If God did not have his logos, if he did not have his wisdom, he wouldn't have reason. But the logos is not merely an attribute. Rather, it has independent life, not a participated life, else it would lose its simplicity. That's a quote. We participate in life. We are given existence. Independent life is a necessary being, ultimately uh, is simple in its essence, and that is who God is. Furthermore, the Logos has a will, but it must be equal with his power because, quote, a mixture of choice and impotence would, again, destroy the simplicity, end quote. I hope you see where he's going with that, right? It must be equal. It must be one. So his will and his power and his goodness and his love and his justice and all those things are one. Uh, Gregory goes on with precision, hammering out the point that the son's essence is simple as the father's, though he is generated his essence, 
Though he is generated, his essence is not generated. Remember, we're talking about relationship. We can't confuse essence and relationship. It's his, it's his uh, relation that is generated, not his essence. Gregory places strong emphasis on that point because his opponents insist that the ungenerate is synonymous with simple essence. Therefore, you can track with me here, if the son is generate, then he could not have the simple essence as the father. Again, confusion of relations and essence. In demonstrating the illogical nature of his opponent's claims, Gregory pins them into a corner whereby they need to either accept the distinction denoted by the terms ungenerate and generate as proper to either person, not their nature, or the Messiah with Sibelius, who is the father of modalism. Later, Gregory gets into an interesting discussion regarding how the father and the son communicate with the aim of demonstrating that the son is ungenerate as the father is. I chose this rabbit trail just to show the level of rigor, deta uh, of rigorous, detailed thought we find in many of the early church fathers. We speak words, talking about people, right? We utter words which require air for us to speak. Our vocal cords, we have air to produce the sound. So then Gregory asks, what is the medium of how the words are exchanged between bodies. Gregory talks about at atmospheric space differing in its nature from the nature of human bodies. It's interesting to see the level of scientific understanding as early as we see in the Church Fathers. Whereas many moderns are guilty of, I think the term that uh, C.S. Lewis coined was chronological snobbery, yeah, chronological snobbery, thinking that humans didn't have a developed scientific understanding of the world in pre-modern times. Now, Gregory's point in asking this question is to then look at God who is immaterial without a body. What medium is there between the Father and the Son to communicate? And this is what he says. He says, For we hardly stop to consider that God is not separable into apprehensive faculties as we are, Though, whose perceptions separately apprehend their corresponding objects. For example, sight apprehends what may be seen, hearing what may be heard, so that touch does not taste, and hearing has no perception of odors and flavors, but each confines itself to that function to which it was appointed by nature, holding itself insensible, as it were, to those with which it has no natural correspondence, and incapable of tasting the pleasure enjoyed by its neighbor's sense. But with God, it's otherwise. God is all in all. We have senses which are used for specific things. We taste, we see, we touch, and those occur in a created world according to what is proper of creatures. God, Gregory says, is, quote, at once sight, hearing, knowledge. There we stop. End quote. He continues, For it is not permitted us to ascribe the more animal perceptions to that refined nature. End quote. So the point that Gregory is getting at is that the Son communicates with the Father prior to creation. So if the Father and the Son communicate, what medium exists and must need to exist in order for the Father and the Son to communicate? End quote. The Son and the Father are before creation. Voice and speech came to be in creation. The answer? There is no medium between the Father and the Son because there is no separation. There is no disconnection. The Father and the Son are inseparable, having a, quote, union and blending of spiritual with spiritual through their identity of will, end quote. I think it's a great, great um, analogy to where he works through when it comes to how we speak. And obviously, you know, Scripture is using, is communicating a language in a way that we can understand. But obviously, there is communication that we see going between the Father and the Son. But they don't speak in the way that we do in a created type of atmosphere or world or a created medium. They have, they're unified together as one. So their will, their one will is how they ultimately uh, communicate. Uh, Gregory dresses an objection from the creation account in Genesis. 
He says, isn't this a case where the father is speaking to his son? Gregory notes that the father and the son are inseparable and have an identity of will. But in creation, in the creation account, it seems that the father is sharing his will with the son by speaking. If they are of one will and share that identity because they are in union, why is the father speaking to the son in a manner that seems like he is communicating his will to him and then he creates? Interesting question. Now, maintaining a consistent metaphysical understanding between created and uncreated, Gregory reminds us of the medium of scripture that has been given to us, written in our language and conception of the physical world, to help us comprehend things of God. A little footnote here. Um, regarding the place and importance of scripture in constructing theology, Gregory writes, quote, we make the Holy Scriptures the rule and the measure of every tenet. We necessarily fix our eyes upon that and approve that alone which may be made to harmonize with the intention of those writings. End quote. So getting back to our lecture here. We believe that God creates by speaking. However, we have no way of understanding what the actual act of creating is. Revelation 4.11 says, By the will of God... All things exist and were created. Uh, Moses records God's demonstration of the power of his will but through the medium of human language so that we can comprehend in some matter God's act of bringing the world into existence. Gregory writes, The scriptural account of the creation is the learner's introduction, as it were, to the knowledge of God, representing to our minds the power of the divine being by objects more ready to our comprehension, for sensible apprehension as an aid to intellectual knowledge. On this account, uh, let me restate that. I think the print or the parenthesis kind of messed it up here. So, um, the power of the divine being by objects more ready to our comprehension. On this account, Moses, by saying that God commanded all things to be, signifies to us the inciting power of His will, and by adding. And it was so. He shows that in the case of God, there is no difference between will and performance. End quote. By his will, God creates. He speaks everything into existence. Nothing is too hard for him. God, by his wisdom, has gifted us with speech to match the capacity of our natures. The divine nature is vastly different from ours in that nothing is univocal between us. Univocal means univoice or one voice. It's not the same. It's analogical. <clears throat> At this point, Gregory is referring to anthropomorphic language in scripture used to describe things about God that are like our understanding so that we get to know what God is like because we can't truly understand what God is. Importantly, especially in our modern context, Gregory is emphatically against taking passages of Scripture literally that speak of God having eyes, fingers, feet, or smells. To do so is to make God an anthropomorphous deity after the similitude of what we see among ourselves. <clears throat> the problem was that rigid anthropomorphic language puts us dangerously close to bringing the Creator as He is down to the creature. And we deal with that problem now. Our language as pastors and theologians can get sloppy at times. We're describing things about God. Now granted, God has given us language to express what God is like, and that's the point of it. We say what God is like. We cannot say as he is. Uh, God does come down to his creatures, but he does so by the word. We cannot apply such figures of speech to the divine essence until he manifests himself in the human nature. The importance of maintaining this distinction is paramount for upholding a consistent theology that retains a proper creator-creature distinction. So towards the end of his answer to Enomius, Gregory treats the subject of divine accommodation as it relates to that which is uncreated and incomprehensible being able to reveal and to relate to creatures. Gregory wor Gregory's words, some of which are most often attributed to Calvin, show God's act of grace in accommodating himself to human language. Gregory writes, But since that which is by nature finite cannot rise above its prescribed limits, or lay hold of the superior nature of the Most High, on this account he, 
bringing his power, so full of love for humanity, down to the level of human weaknesses, weakness, so far as it was possible for us to receive it, bestowed on us this helpful gift of grace. For as by divine dispensation the Son, tempering the intensity of his full beams with the intervening air, pours down light as well as heat on those who receive his rays, being himself unapproachable by reason of the weakness of our nature, so the divine power, after the manner of the illustration I have used, though exalted far above our nature and inaccessible to all approach, like a tender mother who joins in the, in, joins in the inarticulate utterances of her babe, gives our human nature what it is capable of receiving. End quote. If you've read Calvin, you're familiar with Calvin, you caught that little last clause at the end, right? like a tender mother who joins in the articulate utterances of her babe. So that wasn't Calvin. That was Gregory of Nyssa. Check real quick. And interestingly, Gregory says that in God's act of accommodating himself to man, speaking in his language, he also assumes wrath, pity, and such like emotions. It's important because a lot of people now, um, in modern context, think God has emotions. But no, Gregory's saying these are accommodations for us. God doesn't have emotions like we do. Um, again, I'll I will say it again. Modern theology wants to speak of God having emotions univocally as man does. Classical theology, however, understands that God, as Gregory indicates, accommodates to man's emotions, quote, so that through feelings corresponding to our own infantile life might be led as by hand and lay hold of the divine nature by means of the words which his foresight has given, end quote. So what does Gregory mean by that? It is without question that God is not subject to any passions, such as pity, pleasure, or anger. But yet we see in Scripture, as Gregory points out, that the Lord takes pleasure in his servants. He is angry with those who fall away from the righteous path, and he shows mercy to those who don't deserve mercy. So then what is God's purpose in expressing himself in a manner that is not proper of the divine nature? Gregory writes, according to God's foresight, these words are for teaching us and helping our infirmity through the display of his providence. By using our own idioms of speech, so that such as are inclined to sin may be restrained from committing it by fear of punishment, and that those are overtaken by it may not despair of return, by the way every repentance when they see God's mercy while those who are walking uprightly and strictly may yet more adorn their life with virtue, as knowing that by their own life they rejoice in him whose eyes are over the righteous. End quote. So Gregory maintains consistency in his understanding of the essence of God and that of man. Scripture is the medium of God's accommodation to mankind, so that we can know that which is unknowable. And in Christ, the word of God makes himself known to man in a mysterious act. He enters his creation, taking on flesh, fully becoming man, the divine life can exist as man. This same life, quote, one and continuous in itself, infinite and eternal, in no wise bounded by any limit to its infinity, end quote, has chosen to do the impossible of bounding himself in human flesh. the divine nature, quote, simple, uniform, and incomposite, took on that which is complex, multiformed, and composite. We must never rid ourselves of the mystery, but rather we must discern the mystery. Now, while much has been stated regarding the, regarding the Father and the Son, there has been little mention of the Spirit. Gregory, however, has a short treatise in defending the deity, consubstantiality, and co-eternality of the Spirit, written against the followers of Macedonius. So he was a Semi-Arian who believed that the Spirit was not a person of the Godhead, but a divine energy diffused throughout the universe. Kind of like what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. They believe the Spirit is God's energy, or a, or a force. Um, 
the Macedonians, or the followers of Macedonians, excuse me, they see the Spirit in every sense inferior to the Father and the Son, having no share of honor, having only the power needed according to the what God has assigned him. Should be it, not him, right? <clears throat> At the onset of his treatise, Gregory, following the form of the true faith, has articulated, as articulated in the Nicene Creed, says, We, for instance, confess that the Holy Spirit is of the same rank as the Father and the Son, so that there is no difference between them in anything to be thought or named that devotion can ascribe to a divine nature. We confess that, save his being, contemplated as with particular attributes in regard of person, the Holy Spirit is indeed from God, and of the Christ, according to Scripture, but that, while not to be confounded with the Father in being never originated, nor with the Son in being the only begotten, and while to be regarded separately in certain distinctive properties, he has in all else, as I have just said, an exact identity with them. So again, he wants to make sure that he is not confusing the relationships, because we would say... Um, that the Father is never originated, right? I'm um, sorry, this, the, he's unoriginate, so the Spirit can't be. The Son is the only begotten, well, the Spirit can't be. So he has a distinct um, relation to the Father and the Son coming from uh, the Father through the Son. Or as the Filioque would, would have it, is that the Spirit comes from both the Father and the Son, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Gregory's response to his opponents is amusing because there is no need to generate a new, profound argument to make his case. Rather, he says, quote, What then shall be our way of arguing? We shall answer nothing new, nothing of our own invention. We shall fall back upon the testimony of Holy Scripture. End quote. Scripture reveals the divine qualities of the Spirit, clearly which means the Spirit exactly as the Father and the Son is also, quote, simple, uniform, and incomposite, end quote, having all the perfections of true deity. And then Gregory, like we see often in many of the fathers, gives support to his argument by way of a material analogy, using fire as an example. He writes, Fire naturally imparts the sense of heat to those who touch it with all its component parts. One part of it does not have the heat more intense, the other less intense, but as long as it is fire at all, it exhibits an invariable oneness with itself in an absolutely complete sameness of activity. If in any part it gets cooled at all, in that part it can no longer be called fire. For, with the change, with the change of its heat-giving activity into the reverse, its name also is changed. Fire is fire through and through, not having parts that can be more or less fire, for it is all fire. If it can be cooled, it is no longer called fire. Likewise, the Spirit has all the divine perfections fully and completely. If it could change to the reverse, it would need to be changed because it would no longer be divine. Gregory's point is that Scripture reveals that the Spirit has all the qualities of the Father and the Son. Therefore, he must be called divine as the Father and the Son. If he had any quality that was not proper to the divine essence, then he could not be worthy of glory, and he would not be the Holy Spirit. Gregory, Gregory observes the perfections of the Spirit as of the Father and the Son. As Scripture teaches, the Spirit is, quote, absolutely good and omnipotent and wise and glorious and eternal. He does not possess these attributes in measure only, as an emanation of God might have, the Holy Spirit is single and simple in every respect equally, is himself goodness and wisdom and power and sanctification and righteousness and everlasting and imperishability, end quote. After his treatise on the Spirit, we come across a short treatise on the Trinity, the Godhead, and the Spirit, which is in response to the assertion by an opponent, his name is Eustathius, that the Trinity implies three gods. Gregory begins with clarity. Quote, we anathematize any man who says that there are three gods and hold them to be not even a Christian, end quote. <laughs> That'd be a great bumper sticker to put back on your window. We anathematize any man who says that there are three gods and hold them to be not even a Christian. I just might do that. 
<laughs> I just might do that. Uh, Gregory briefly explains the charge from Eustathius, which, quote, we divide the persons and do not employ any of the names which belong to God in the plural, end quote. His charge is that he speaks of the three persons, but only one Godhead having power, instead of speaking of three as having power, goodness, goodness, etc. Scripture, says his opponents, do, does not support such a doctrine. Gregory immediately replies to this charge, and he writes, quote, Let the inspired scripture then be our umpire, and the vote of truth will surely be given to those whose dogmas are found to agree with the divine words. End quote. Gregory refers to Colossians 2.9 and Romans 1.20, demonstrating the scriptures confine us to one God, speaking of Christ, having the fullness of deity, and the creation indicative of his divine power and Godhead. To speak in plurals of power and deity is to fall into tritheism. His opponents see that the Father is God and the Son is God, but render the Spirit as having power from the Father and the Son, but is separate from the divine nature, thus also the divine glory. In response, Gregory, Greg, Gregory, not Gregory, <laughs> Gregory articulates the Trinitarian doctrine. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are joined as one with the Spirit included, quote, with the Father and the Son in life-giving power, end quote. Having an inseparable association, the appellations of good, holy, wise, eternal, righteous, chief, and mighty belong to all three. Gregory then grounds his claim with simplicity language, stating, quote, For all the divine attributes, whether named or conceived, are of the like rank one with another, and that they are not distinguishable in respect of the signif signification of their subject, but the thing to which all the attributes point is one. And if you speak of God, you signify the name whom you understood by the other attributes. End quote. And from this understanding of the divine essence, when we see its operations in Scripture, all three, for example, sanctify, give life, light, comfort, and other graces. Gregory's approach that we see is thoroughly biblical. The Scripture manifests the identity of God in his operations in creation and redemption. And since the scriptures testify that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit operate in a manner that is proper to God alone, and in one motion sticking with the divine scripture, Gregory affirms that we must conclude that each is fully God, having the, quote, undistinguishable character of their divine substance, end quote. Oh, excuse me, jaw's hurting a little bit. All right. We are now going to be looking at um, Gregory of Nyssa's On Not Three Gods to Oblabius. <clears throat> I think this is really a, a pivotal work that uh, you should read. Uh, I recommend you can find it free on the internet, or if you have the, um, the Church Fathers series that's out there. Hendrickson published that one, but again, it is all free. But I will look up this one specifically. It's a short treatise um, on Not Three Gods to Oblabius. It's a very complex argument that that, um, that Gregory lays out in response to the claim that three divine persons equal three gods. So I think this is kind of like probably one of the most profound treatises in the Church Fathers when it comes to articulating the divine persons and not being guilty of tritheism. So I recommend reading it, going through it. Um, I told a, a few people before to get it, to read it, and it's not very long, but then try to then explain it in your own words. And if you do that, you'll have it down. So we're going to go through it here. So basically put, Ablabius, uh, it's, it's his opponent, it's a person, it's, it's his opponent that he's having a, a debate with, but he charges Gregory with teaching that there are three gods. Now, this might be an objection that we have come across or um, have had to explain to others, even to uh, Jehovah's Witness. They come knock on your door, and they they are ready for the debate. They're ready to knock down your Trinitarian perspective. So I think if you can maybe really work through this and understand this, it might be a really good way of defending the deity of Christ. And um, It's a little complicated. Like I said, you probably want to listen to this again, but definitely get the... Uh, 
the treatise on not three gods, two oblivious. Anyways, okay. So Gregory's Trinitarian theology, again, he's an Eastern father, differs from the Western view, most notably in its monarchical form, which was consistent with many of the early church fathers. This kind of really changed later on uh, in the Latin fathers, specifically with Augustine. Now, there's some debate that there was that there, there were really kind of opposites, but really, um, I think later later studies have really shown there's much more cohesiveness between the two. So the Eastern view posited that to affirm one God, there must be one God. Simple enough. And as that one God, the Father, which Scripture and the early creeds of the Church affirm, is the source from which the Son and the Spirit come. Now I have a little footnote here because this is what's called the Filioque Controversy. I recommend seeing uh, Robert Lethem's book, The Holy Trinity in Scripture, History, Theology, and Worship. It's a very good summary of it, but I have a, I have a little note here. We'll just kind of briefly state about what it is. So, so it's with the intentions of advancing, with the intentions of advancing an ecclesial response against the Arian claim that Christ was a created being. A 6th century church council in Toledo, Spain, added the word filioque, which means and, and the Son, to a, to a creed describing the procession of the Holy Spirit, thereby affirming that the Holy Spirit was sent by the Father and the Son. The Eastern Church objected to the addition because it was a speculative move beyond what Scripture teaches about the Spirit. While there were other factors, this controversy initiated the formal schism of 1054 between the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. The debate pertains to the problem of affirming Jesus as the source equal to the Father in sending the Spirit. Reason being, to be monotheist, there can only be one source who is the Father. If Jesus is the source as the Father is, then we have two gods. So I think you can see the, the logic of the argument, and that's ultimately what also the Cappadocians are um, championing as well as being monarchialists or monar monarchists, however that word would, would how you would ever apply that. But but anyway, it's a monarchical form, and I and I find this view very very persuasive. I know when I went through this, I thought, wow, that makes a lot of sense, and I think it was really helpful in explaining um, uh, the deity of the three persons, all sharing uh, of the one God. Um, let's hold on a second, my jaws. <laughs> when I do these lectures, my jaw gets really tight. So we moderns see such language and think Gregory is drifting away from a Trinitarian doctrine. However, that is not the case. The Son and the Spirit are of the same nature as the Father. Same essence, same nature, everything. According to Gregory, when the divine persons are, re are referenced together in the New Testament, we see an order in the Godhead. So he's grounding this in the biblical text. The one God, the Father, one Lord, Jesus Christ. Example, he gives us 1 Corinthians 8, 6. And if you know that text, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It kind of lays out this kind of order or taxonomy, if you will, to be more, uh, it's like one of those $50 words, taxonomy. <coughs> Excuse me. For Gregory, what classifies all three to be of the same nature is their power and activity as manifested in creation and scripture. And if you remember in the very beginning, I talked about their energy and power is what ultimately makes them of the divine essence. Uh, in this letter, in and this and this letter, excuse me, details Gregory's development of this argument to demonstrate that we believe in one God, not three gods. The crucial the crucial issue in the debate concerns the grammar of divinity. Lewis Ayres, a historical theologian, really well known, he wrote a great work about this. Um, he points out that the 4th century controversies are, in part, easily misunderstood if they are conceived as con of concentrating on the question, is the Son and the Spirit divine? It was understood that the Father was the Arche, the source from which the Son and the Spirit come. The challenge then was in accepting that the Son was truly the same nature as the Father. The divine essence was understood to be simple and inseparable. Therefore, to affirm real distinction in the divine essence where the persons exist as individual hypostases was problematic. Uh, a little footnote here. There's a letter that, that, uh, that Gregory writes to his brother Peter 
where he analyzes the terms usia and hypostasis. And here, this is probably like the clearest understanding of these terms uh, in the Cappadocian theology. It is called Letter 35 to Peter, his own brother, on the divine usio, usia and hypostasis in Anna M. Silvis, Gregory of Nyssa, the letters, introduction, translation, and commentary, Gregory of Nyssa, the letters. That's a book by Brill. Super expensive. Not going to find it, but um, yeah, if you want to, might be able to find it free PDF online. That's usually how a lot of stuff can be found these days. Anyways, um, where was I at? Okay. So, as noted, it is the grammar of divinity that needs developing. Gregory's approach marks a broad shift in pro Nicene theology in his discussion of the Son being homoousios with the Father, sharing the divine essence, while both the Son and the Spirit coming from the Father and acting in creation. On the surface, Ablavius' charge seems valid. How is our belief in a triune God consistent with monotheism? Gregory begins his letter by stating Ablavius' argument, which goes like this. Peter, James, and John, being in one human nature, are called three men. And there is no absurdity in describing those who are united in nature, if they are more than one, by the plural number of the name derived from their nature. If, then, in the above case, custom admits this, and no one forbids us to speak of those who are two as two, or those who are more than two as three, how is it that in the case of our statements of the mysteries of the faith, though confessing the three persons and acknowledging no difference of nature between them, we are, at, we are in some sense at variance with our confession when we say that the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is one, and yet for, forbid men to say there are three gods. See what he's saying? Gregory is very forthright about the difficulty of this problem. We have a language issue. We enumerate the divine persons, but do not admit their plurality as we would Peter, James, and John. We would say they have the same nature as humans, but we designate them as distinct beings from each other. Thus we have three men. Whereas when it comes to the persons of the Godhead, each having the divine nature, we do not have three gods. Now Gregory delineates this further. So when we speak of men, we say Luke is a man or Stephen is a man, but we don't say Stephen is Luke or Luke is Stephen. There's a separation of persons, beings, though having the common nature of man, they are considered separate from each other. Man isn't proper to Luke it is common to him, as it is to Stephen, to any other man that has lived, lives, or will ever live. The nature of man is inseparable, not capable of increase or decrease. Although it appears in a plurality, it is nevertheless complete and not divided with the individuals, Stephen and Luke, who participate in it. Gregory points out that the challenge is in the manner of how we speak about people. We refer to groups, people, an army, or a mob, in the singular. Though understood to be a plurality, man is still considered one, even though the one nature of man is exhibited to us as a plurality. As it pertains to God, we have to confess that God is one according to Scripture, Deuteronomy 6.4, though the name Godhead extends through the Holy Trinity. The disparity lies in what we know and that, I'm sorry, the disparity lies in that we know it is improper, quote, in case of human nature, to extend the name of the nature by the mark of plurality, end quote. Even though an army is made up of a plurality, the human nature is only one. It is not multiplied. Thus, with God, it is improper for us to associate the name Godhead with the divine nature because, as Scripture teaches us, the divine nature is unnameable and unspeakable. So, whatever name we use to speak of the divine nature, such names cannot signify the nature itself. So what does Gregory mean by that? And he writes, 
For, for we may say, it may be, that the deity is incorruptible or powerful or whatever else we are accustomed to say of him. But in each of these terms we find a peculiar sense, fit to be understood or asserted of the divine nature, yet not expressing that which that nature is in its essence. For the subject, whatever it may be, is incorruptible. But our conception of incorruptibility is this, that that which is, is not resolved into decay. So when we say that he is incorruptible, we declare that his nature does not suffer, but we do not express what that is which does not suffer corruption. End quote. We do not perceive divinity directly. Rather, we do so by a process of what Gregory calls epinoia, or the process of abstracting conceptions or reflecting on the things about God based upon what he has revealed to us in creation and scripture, which provides us a guiding grammar to speak analogously, though truthfully, about God. Another drink. However, we maintain the understanding that we cannot know God in the truest sense. But somehow we can touch God. However, he always remains unknown. Gregory says this process of epinoia is continual. Elsewhere he writes, quote, But in applying such appellations to the divine essence, which passeth all understanding, we do not seek to glory in it by the names we employ, but to guide our own selves by the aid of such terms towards the comprehension of the things which are hidden. End quote. Gregory notes that we use the name Godhead to describe God's activity. His nature is unknown to us, as watching over us, seeing or beholding. The three persons are ascribed each of these activities in Scripture. In Psalm 84 9, David says of the Father, quote, See, O God, our defender, end quote, in which sight is a proper operation of God. In Matthew 9 4, Jesus sees the thoughts of those who condemn him, questioning his power to pardon sinners. In the classic passage of Ananias and Sapphira, of their lying to Peter in Acts 5 3, in which the Holy Spirit is the true witness of this act, in that we that he was aware of their secret actions, sharing with Peter what he observed. So in Gregory's analysis of the term Godhead, whereby each member of the Trinity is engaged in the same activity of seeing, he concludes that, quote, if the activities are the same, then the power which gave rise to them is the same, and the ineffable divine nature in which that power is inherent must also be one, end quote. But Gregory admits that this argument is not satisfactory. The three gods' claim still has relevance because mankind, having the same nature, does the same things proper to humanity, which are appropriately spoken of as three. And he says it's like three orators, three shoemakers, we can say three doctors, three artists, right? So, understanding this issue, Gregory moves on to bring the apparent a contradiction to a close. As it pertains to the common example of humanity, we understand that each of those activities are done by separate individuals. Quote, according to the special character of each one's operation, end quote. And therefore, Gregory writes, these pursuits would be considered many. However, as it pertains to the divine nature, Gregory writes, we do not similarly learn that the Father does anything by himself in which the Son does not work conjointly, or again, that the Son has any special operation apart from the Holy Spirit. But every operation which extends from God to the creation and is named according to our variable conceptions of it has its origin from the Father and proceeds through the Son and is perfected in the Holy Spirit. For this reason, the name derived from the operation is not divided with regard to the number of those who fulfill it because the action of each concerning anything is not separate and peculiar. But whatever comes to pass in reference either to the acts of his providence for us or to the government and constitution of the universe comes to pass by the action of the three, yet what does come to pass is not three things. End quote. 
Gregory is illuminating to us that the Trinity has an order from which the divine activity or energia of the three persons is one motion communicated from the Father through the Son to the Spirit. The divine nature is unknown, but we see the divine operations carried out by one power leading to a conception of an undivided Godhead. Gregory deploys a helpful phrase from the na- from nature which speaks of the power and action of God, quote, issuing from the Father as from a spring brought into operation by the Son and perfecting His grace by the power of the Spirit, end quote. In phrasing his his understanding of God's divine activity, demonstrating his power and character, Gregory addresses the three gods problem in that God's activity is not individuated as we would see in human natures. God's activity is observed in creation and narrated in scripture reveals one power, which always works without delay according to the motion of the divine will, quote, by unitary causal sequenced activity of the three persons, end quote. Again, the motion is of the divine will, quote, by a unitary causal sequenced activity of the three persons, end quote. Godhead is a name. It is an appellation given to the unlimited and incomprehensible divine nature. Gregory notes, quote, that the deity is above every name and Godhead is a name, end quote. In revisiting the error, applying the name of a nature to denote a multitude, Gregory emphasizes the point that Scripture never speaks of God as gods. Nature is indivisible, however. Sorry, nature is indivisible. However, Gregory writes, Scripture names men in the plural because, this is a quote, no one is by a figure of speech led astray in his conceptions to imagine a multitude of humanities or supposes that many human natures are indicated by the fact that, that the name expressive of nature is used in the plural, end quote. As it pertains to Scripture's reference to God, quote, the Father is God, the Son is God, and yet, by the same proclamation, God is one, because no difference either of nature or of operation is contemplated in the Godhead, end quote. The Lord our God is one Lord, with Scripture declaring the only begotten Son as God from the Father, though we do not have two gods. The reason for our proclamation that God is one, Gregory writes, is because, quote, no difference either of nature or of operation is contemplated in the Godhead, end quote. Uh, Lewis Ayers, he succinctly says, quote, the sequence of the one divine action and ad extra, sorry, the sequence of the one divine action ad extra, reflects the nature and order of God's internal generation, and in both the same sequence of causality is operative. Remember, ad extra is outside. The work's done outside of God's self. Uh, Gregory, as he ends his letter to Oblavius, he addresses the matter of the distinction of persons. The The matter looms overhead because of the human understanding of individuation. The persons are distinguished from one, from one, sorry, from each other. One, the Father, is without cause. The only begotten is directly from the first cause, with the Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son. Gregory notes, But in speaking of cause and of the cause, we do not by these words denote nature, for no one would give the same definition of cause and of nature. But we indicate the difference in manner of existence. For when we say that one is caused, and that the others without cause, we do not divide the nature by the word cause, but only indicate the fact that the Son does not exist without generation, nor the Father by generation. End quote. So his point is that generation presents the mode of existence, but what exists is not indicated by the phrase generation. The phrase unbegotten as applied to the Son teaches us the mode of his existence and how we are to conceive of him, but it does not tell us what he is. And in recognizing as such, the grammar of divinity allows us to acknowledge a distinction in the Trinity whereby one is the cause and another is of the cause, and thus, quote, we can no longer be accused of confounding the definition of the persons by the community of nature, end quote. And then Gregory concludes his letter to Ablabius. He says, 
Thus, since on the one hand the idea of cause differentiates the persons of the Holy Trinity, declaring that one exists without a cause, and another is of the cause, and since on the one hand the divine nature is apprehended by every conception as unchangeable and undivided, for these reasons we properly declare that the Godhead to be one, and God to be one, and employ in the singular all other names which express divine attributes." End quote. So Gregory here, he set out to delineate a Trinitarian doctrine that was logically derived from Holy Scripture. His dynamic line of argumentation, whereby the energia, the activity and power of God, is observed in a causal from through in order by each of the persons cogently and coherently articulated a monarchical formula of divine power and activity from God the Father mediated through the only begotten Son and perfected in the Spirit. The triune God, therefore, is not three gods. So in conclusion, as you've seen that Gregory is truly a rigorous thinker, uh, he and the Cappadocian trio have made a momentous turn in Trinitarian theology, and they remain the key Trinitarian, Trinitarian architects for the Eastern Church and are considered still giants in that tradition. They're, gi they're giants in, in all of Christian theology, they really are. Um, so the next lesson, we will look at Gregory of Nazianzus, observing the profound thought that he brought to the table in the development of the doctrine of the uh, doctrine of God and the Trinity. So again, I recommend you probably want to listen to this again. Um, and as I mentioned, I would highly recommend find in his On Not Three Gods. You can find it free on, on the internet. Um, but thanks again for joining us, and we will see you next time.